Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Aboriginal AIDS Awareness Week uh, Two Spirit Day. You are currently attending the Two Spirit panel, uh, where we have some amazing, uh, very informative, experienced individuals, resilient individuals, to talk about uh, the Indigenous health and response to HIV, the TRC's calls to action, and the unique experience of Two Spirit peoples when we're looking at. Uh, uh, HIV within the Indigenous communities. Uh, I'm more than excited to be able to offer this alongside the Canadian Aboriginal AIDS Network. Uh, my apologies, I jumped before saying hello. My name is Jack Saddleback. I go by uh, I go by he him pronouns. Uh, I'm from the Samson Cree Nation of Musquatchies, Alberta, and today I am representing Out Saskatoon. Um, I am happy to say that I'm actually kind of wearing two hats today. I have our cultural and projects coordinator hat, but I uh, have just taken on a co-interim executive director position here with our organization. So I'm quite uh, pleased and humbled to know that the work that uh, we can do within the queer community can further the aspects of reconciliation and decolonization. Now we have uh, just a few housekeeping items that I may actually uh turn over to uh, my co-host here by the name of uh, Janessa Tom who's just going to kind of go over a few housekeeping items. Hi everyone my name is Janessa Tom and I'm a program assistant with the Canadian Aboriginal AIDS Network. I live here on Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis Nation otherwise known as Saskatoon Saskatchewan. Jack and I have worked tangentially on AAAW events for the last couple of years, and so I was really excited to be able to have the opportunity to work with him on this Two-Spirit event. So I'd like to say thank you to Jack and Out Saskatoon, as well as our panelists, Elder Marjorie, Elder Albert, and Martin, for being willing to share your stories and experiences uh, with the audience and all of those who are joining us from across the land today. So to begin, as Jack mentioned, we have a couple housekeeping notes. So for those of you who are French speakers, for French audio translation, you can click on the Traduction Audio en Français under Session Information. For English closed captions, you can click on English captions under Session Information. If you require technical support, you can contact Live Support at the top right of your screen. It should show up in a red button. If you have any questions for the presenters, you can submit them via the Live Q&A box on the right side of your screen. There will also be an opportunity for a Q&A at the end of the panel. The discussion form on the right side of your screen can be used to share comments about the presentations and topics. And there will be an evaluation at the end of the session, which will pop up on the right side of your screen under the poll section. I'll come on at about 11.40, uh, about 20 minutes before we end, just to remind you about that. We would really appreciate if you could complete those evaluation questions. And more information about the platform can be found in the attendee FAQ, which is available in the help section on the top right of the platform. So now I will pass this back to Jack. Amazing, thank you. So uh, I believe today I'd love to be able to start off with uh, number one, a land acknowledgement of each of the lands that everyone comes from will be as treaty people. Uh, both on treaty land and on ceded territory as well, acknowledge that our ancestors of, uh, of these lands have gotten us to where we are. So in, in saying that, I do want to lay some tobacco down for, for them at a later date, but this morning I, I did smudge, so uh, those prayers are up there. So I thank each and every one of you for joining us, wherever you may be here on Turtle Island. It's much appreciated that you come and learn these experiences here from these uh, great individuals of uh, 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 Albert McLeod, actually Dr. Albert McLeod, if I am not mistaken, uh, Elder Marjorie Bukage, and uh, last but certainly not least, my fabulous friend of Martin Morberg, uh, as we discuss the Indigenous Health in Response to HIV, the QRC's Call to Action, the Unique Experience of two Spirits. So on behalf of Out Saskatoon, uh, I'd love to say some opening remarks in regards to um, what today means for us as an organization, but I think for us, uh, more specifically myself as a Two-Spirit person, um, today is actually an interesting and unique position. Uh, typically, 
we at Out Saskatoon, as well as the Canadian Aboriginal AIDS Network and the uh, Saskatchewan, or Saskatoon Indian Métis Friendship Center and the White Buffalo Youth Center here in Saskatoon, typically partner up for our annual uh, Memorial uh, Two-Spirit Feast and Round Dance. Unfortunately, like all things in today's life, uh, things have uh, slightly pivoted. And I am more than excited to continue on to honor those individuals who have uh, been affected by, uh, who are living with, uh, or who unfortunately have passed away from HIV and some AIDS complications as well. Uh, we, as Indigenous people, continue on our ceremonies in whatever way that we can. And today's uh, discussion is simply a reflection of that. You know, we are honoring those spirits, we are honoring those resilient community members. Uh, in in these lands that uh, consistently stand up to the challenging colonial landscapes that we all must work within. So on behalf of Out Saskatoon, I am uh, more than happy to say that we can partner to do this and bring these voices forward. In saying so, I would also like to reiterate that Out Saskatoon is now moving into a very interesting direction within our organization. Uh, not necessarily speaking specifically to my new position as a co-interim executive director, but just as an organization as a whole, we realize that within the queer community, we have to do better when it comes to Indigenous health. We have to do better when it comes to intersectionality, and we must be able to stand up and, and be uh, intersectional, uh, accessible, and as, as aware of the aspects of marginalized communities, but in all honesty, I call them resilient communities because let's face it, we've all been through the ringer when it comes to this larger uh, society here. Uh, so in saying so, we at Oats ask to and certainly do uh, ensure that our work going forward will take on those lenses. So I wanna thank uh, Albert, Marjorie, Martin, and and my, my good counterpart here, who has just been fantastic to work with, uh, Janessa, for being able to, to bring this work forward, but also as we move forward as an organization and the larger queer community, that we can we can do this work in a good way. So uh, on behalf of Outsaskin, thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to uh, quickly go over to uh, maybe our, our good friend Janessa there. If you wanted to say anything on behalf of uh, the Canadian, Canadian Aboriginal AIDS Network, uh, in regards to this day, that would be uh, much appreciated. Great, thank you, Jack. Again, so I would just like to thank everybody who is joining us today. AAAW does look a little bit different. So we're used to having events within our communities. Uh, and right now we're in a virtual environment and we're doing everything online. And so we appreciate all the effort that our friends have put into this week, our friends, our colleagues, uh, in trying to make this an effective and impactful event week just as it normally is um, at can you know we're going through some changes we have a wonderful new ceo uh margaret kisaka piesis who is leading our organization in a great new direction and so i am so thrilled to have the support of margaret and the entire management team uh, behind me in working on this event and i truly appreciate jack for partnering with me again we've worked together tangentially before and so when I had the opportunity to put together a Two-Spirit Day, um, immediately I thought about Jack because I just moved to Saskatoon um, about a year and a half ago. And so the first person who I had a connection with that popped into my mind for this was, oh, Jack. And so thank you so much, Jack, for <laughs> being willing to partner here with me today uh, for this event. I really couldn't have done it without you. So thank you for taking the reins on this. And so, uh, on behalf of Ken, I would like to thank you so much for being here and thank you for being flexible and willing to participate in AAAW in a different type of environment than what we're normally used to. And so I really, really hope you enjoy the day. Um, we've got some films that will be screened a little bit later in the day during our video session. And so we would really love to have you participate in that and come watch some films created by our wonderful Two-Spirit community members. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much for those kind words, Janessa. I'm really excited to work alongside you uh, for this Two-Spirit Day as well. We are we are live from coast to coast to coast. 
So it's quite nice to see uh, folks uh, saying hi and uh, being able to be in this space because quite often our two-spirited community, we're friendly neighbors. You know, we all, we all, for the most part, know each other. And if we don't know you, we will know you <laughs> very quickly and uh, take everyone in the fold here. So I'm, I'm very excited to see that we do have some folks who are uh, within the discussion forum in saying so I do want to reiterate that there are some uh, chat functions that you can uh, as attendees be able to go and chat with each other uh, that is through the discussion forum there's also the live Q&A so as we move forward with our uh, speakers here and then moving into the uh, the panel portion feel free to use the, the live Q&A and if you have any other technical difficulties, as Janessa was saying, there are a number of uh, aspects for you to be able to reach out uh, to our team who's uh, working behind uh, closed doors. So I also just want to give a quick little shout out to Sea to Sky and uh, more specifically uh, NG for being able to uh, help us uh, do this very cool uh, room here. Uh, it's quite jazzy to work within. But without further ado, uh, let's hop in. Uh, for today's discussion, I will, do, I, I will reiterate that we will start off with our speakers being able to kind of give about 10 to 15 uh, minutes in regards to their mm -hmm. own discussion points that they would like to, to speak on. Uh, and then we'll go into the uh, question, and pa question uh, portion, which will then be put on to uh, all three panelists here to uh, discuss some of the interesting questions that we have for them. Um, so without further ado, I'd love to invite our very first panelist uh, by the name of Marjorie Bukaj, my good elder here. Uh, Marjorie Bukaj is a Franco Métis from Manitoba, Canada. Uh, she has a degree in education from Brandon University and studied filmmaking at Ryerson she has worked as a filmmaker, cultural administrator, educator, and organizer. Her work within the Two-Spirit community spans over decades, and she has been pivotal in numerous Two-Spirit initiatives here in Treaty 6 territory, but surely beyond as well, all around the world. So without further ado, uh, uh, my good friend Marjorie, feel free to go ahead. Oh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I can't see you, but I know you're there. And um, I just take a moment to uh, remember there are 300 people in Saskatchewan who have died this year of HIV AIDS. And uh, that's 300 people. That's more than even died in COVID, and we hear nothing about it here. So I want to remember them. Uh, we are not a disease. We are not a statistic. These are human beings, real people, real lives that we have lost. 300. That's a lot. A lot. And that loss is... Uh, because the land is sick, we are sick because the land is sick. And the grief and trauma that comes from the loss of our land and the loss of our connection to the land means that we lose a lot of people that need to be in balance, that need to be connected and to be in relationship is lost because we, we've forgotten our connection to the land and we have shut out a lot of our own people from that connection as well, especially the youth who get, who get lost in the cities, then get addicted and then end up being uh, caught up in all of that. And, and we still have so much work to do because of the, of the stigma that still exists uh, in our communities, and, and that's against homosexuality, against HIV, uh, because of that colonial trauma that, that was caused by all the sexual abuse that we carry around, too. So um, I was thinking this morning about when I first heard about 
HIV AIDS and it was back in the 70s when uh, Anita Bryant came to Winnipeg to the convention center to give a speech and she was one of the Christian advocates against uh, you know homosexuality and and I went to my pro a protest there at the convention center when to stand up for for people and then uh and then renee highway and the red sisters came to town and i realized that there were a lot of our brothers at that time who were suffering from hiv and and uh in the artist community is where i uh i had my first connections to that as well and uh because to me the stories are how we remember who we are and and um that is what i have used in my work uh for hiv uh and um like the, I went to work at Ghani Ganichik in Winnipeg for the Aboriginal women responding to the AIDS crisis. And there was, what is our response? How can we respond to all of this uh, crisis? And to me, story is the medicine. If people can make connections with each other through sharing their stories, through expressing themselves in, in uh, art, uh, they're making medicine, they're helping each other, and that's what's most empowering. And that's what uh, we do in our peer support groups, whether it's to spirit or or women or uh, HIV, it's always about helping each other. And and um, the Mimingua Masinate was a project that we did in Winnipeg that uh, was involved art and in community settings where we could take a piece of clay and sit down and talk about sexuality, talk about who we are as sexual beings and how we can be healthy in our relations. And uh, that was, those conversations weren't happening. And, and, uh, and so we had to find ways to do it in a safe way. And I find that um, art is a safe way. Um, and so then we traveled that art to communities and it gave people an opportunity to engage uh, by, by seeing other people's stories and then starting to tell their own. Uh, and then in Saskatchewan, where I am now in the last 10 years, uh, that, that stigma, I realized, is still so embedded in uh, our communities and people are leaving, the young people are leaving, the teachers, young people are leaving because of that homophobia and uh, it's still there. And so that's what we have to address in our own communities, is that stigma still and uh, in working with uh, Visioning Health for the women, um, again, the message was the land. When we go out picking cere ceremony grasses and medicines, the women are happy. They're in contact with the land and each other. And when we do ceremony and when we, when we uh, make art together, that's when their spirits flourish and are nourished. And there's so little uh, of that going on still. And how that's how we need to build to support each other culturally and to get past that, that trauma and grief from that loss. That's, that's the need to be in balance and to be in, in relationship with each other that way. Um, I don't know, that's that's what's on my mind this morning for starters. And uh, um, 
I don't know what else to say. Uh, I, I'm not used to talking in the air like this. So <laughs> I'll just leave it at that for now, Jack, unless you have something else that I should be talking about. No, I think that's perfect. If you'd, uh, if you'd like to, to cap it there, we certainly do have a lot of uh, questions when we get to our panel portion that I, I for mm -hmm. sure think that would um, drum up some uh, other points for you to, to speak to. So if you'd like mm -hmm. to uh, finish there, that's a okay as well. Awesome. Yeah, I think I'll leave it there for now and um, I'll see what people are feeling and thinking and uh, we can continue. Hey, hey, thank you. Thank you, Marjorie. All right, I am very excited to introduce our next speaker by the name of Dr. Albert McLeod here. Uh, Dr. Albert McLeod is a status Indian with ancestry from uh, Nisi Shawa Wayasik Cree Nation. Really hope I got that right. You know, with with our, our language, it certainly does. Uh, you just got to dive right in and just give it all. Uh, so <laughs> with Cree Nation and the Métis community of Norway House in Northern Manitoba. Uh, Albert has over 30 years of experience as a human rights activist and is one of the directors of the Two-Spirited People of Manitoba. Uh, Dr. McLeod began their Two-Spirit advocacy in Winnipeg in 1986 and became an HIV and AIDS activist in 1987. Uh, they were the director of the Manitoba Aboriginal AIDS Task Force from 1991 to 2001. In 2018, Dr. Albert received an honorary doctorate of laws from the University of Winnipeg. Currently, Dr. McLeod lives in Winnipeg, where they work as a consultant specializing in Indigenous peoples, cultural reclamation, and cross-cultural training. And if I may say on more of a personal note, uh, Auntie Albert here has always been one of my idols. As a young little uh, baby queer or a little two-spirit uh, who was just trying to find myself uh, you know, my quick Google search of what Two-Spirit means and you know, what does that mean here in Canada, uh, Auntie Albert here popped up right away. And I've been very fortunate to have uh, worked alongside uh, Dr. McLeod here at a number of different instances. But when I first met you, I was like, I almost cried, <laughs> in all honesty. <laughs> so I thank you so much for all of your hard work throughout the years. And I'm, I'm really fortunate to have you here. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Dr. McLeod. Thank you, Jack and uh, Marjorie and uh, Martin and Janessa on being uh, part of this session today uh, as part of uh, uh, Aboriginal AIDS Awareness Week through the Canadian Aboriginal AIDS Network. And um, from the very beginning of the pandemic and uh, one of the first gatherings that was held by the federal government was in 1988, uh, just after we knew that this was a, a sexually transmitted virus and it could be transmitted by uh, blood as well. And um, uh, they met with uh, elders, traditional healers and knowledge keepers. And I find it an interesting perspective that uh, when something like uh, this new virus came into the world that uh, that was the first place that the federal government went was to our knowledge keepers and our traditional healers. And I think as Marjorie said, that has sort of been our philosophy uh, in responding to uh, you know, HIV back in the day, AIDS, as well as now with this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, which again is a global pandemic and uh, is uh, affecting uh, Indigenous people disproportionately, and as Marjorie talked about as well, uh, the overdose deaths that are happening in Canada, uh, especially among uh, people in urban centres and in the Indigenous population. You know, going back to those days uh, in Vancouver, where I sort of migrated after I, uh, you know, sussed out Winnipeg as a place to live, and it really wasn't, there was really no gay culture here, gay community. And certainly Indigenous queers were not uh, appreciated in the gay scene. So I went to Vancouver in 1979. That was really the time when the virus was making its way into North America and especially among gay men. And uh, certainly uh, two-spirit men in these urban centers were exposed and infected with the virus. And many, 
you know, prior to 1986 had developed uh, AIDS, as we understand that, uh, you know, in the end stage of HIV disease. Uh, and in those days, there was really no treatments uh, for those uh, opportunistic infections that people had. So they became palliative uh, very quickly and died very quickly. Uh, because of the stigma uh, around HIV and AIDS, well, AIDS, I could call it quote unquote AIDS stigma, was uh, you know very prominent uh, around the world. It still is in many uh, cases. That many of these two spirit men uh, never made it home. Um, you know, many were rejected by the family. Uh, many died alone in hospitals in Vancouver, Toronto. Uh, Winnipeg and uh, Montreal, Calgary. And so that era of the early understanding of this pandemic was really concentrated in my generation. Uh, this year I'll be 65. And so in those days, uh, you know, we were a generation of two spirit people who were dealing with these life altering issues of losing our friends uh, to AIDS mm -hmm. and really not having a voice or having a connection to our communities or support from our leadership in doing this work and uh, guiding people, you know, to the spirit world. But what I've learned from that, you know, is that a birth of a baby is so profound and full of uh, love and energy that there is also the end of our uh, physical journey where that same love and uh, life force uh, presents itself when someone is palliative, when someone's life journey is ending. And so for myself, uh, I'm privileged to have been at those bedsides to witness, you know, uh, people when they uh, go into that spiritual journey and how that manifests. And it really is the mirror of birth. And so for the Two-Spirit community over the last 40 years, uh, we've learned what that means, you know, the, the beauty of birth, but also the meaning of death and that we are only here for a short time relatively. And that, uh, you know, we all live a legacy, uh, whatever it is, no matter what perspective we come from, uh, you know, we leave stories, we leave family, we leave humor, uh, you know, uh, we leave the love that we shared with each other. And even if many of them were very young, even if it was only 20 years, you know, uh, they left a legacy. And I think for the Canadian Aboriginal AIDS Network, that's what we continue to uphold is that legacy of people who were diagnosed with HIV, those who died of AIDS and other, uh, you know, situations, whether it was violence or overdose or poverty, that, you know, that's our job as the survivors is we hold up their legacy uh, and we let them shine without any, you know, uh, concern about criticism, you know, uh, Indigenous people are so, you know, overwhelmed with uh, systemic racism and incremental genocide. You know, uh, we are always challenged to uphold our own people who live normal lives, you know, who live a life. And so that's part of our work at CAM is to, you know, uh, cut through all the bullshit and uh, show, you know, our society that we are strong. Uh, creative uh, people, and we are, you know, able to survive these pandemics. Um, we really don't know, you know, what the true impact of this uh, pandemic of HIV is on Indigenous peoples in Canada. The data is really not clear, but I think in many ways, because uh, Two-Spirit people stepped up to the plate very early, um, by about 1989, that uh, we've mitigated the number of infections that potentially could have, you know, uh, raged through our communities by our early intervention back in, the, you know, the, the 90s. And, uh, you know, those two-spirit people, you know, lesbian, trans, uh, you know, gay and bisexual men who stepped up to the plate and uh, confronted this, these stigmas and uh, worked, you know, diligently for many years uh, in many sectors you know, the federal health sector, uh, the community sector doing outreach, managing projects, 
and uh, Charlotte Brooks just uh, posted uh, uh, a image of her and Dorlin McKay uh, from uh, I think the 90s where it was an outreach poster uh, where there were two HIV positive people, you know, talking about, uh, you know, uh, sexuality and HIV. And, and many, even today, uh, you know, uh, there's still so much big, uh, stigma. People are still concerned about even being attached to a two-spirit identity publicly or uh, talking about HIV or uh, drug use, you know, that... Uh, uh, those things are so stigmatized in our society. There's very few people who are willing to stand up and do it. Uh, but, uh, you know, we really honor today those who continue to do that. Now, uh, part of our journey really has been responding to HIV uh, through our culture. And that began, as I said, very early on uh, with the support of uh, Dr. Myra Laramie, who began to help us understand traditional healing, traditional medicines, a traditional ceremony. That was back in 1993 in Vancouver. And uh, we continued when the CAN was conceived in uh, Winnipeg in 1994, we had a sweat lodge. And so all these little steps uh, we've taken, we've been very thorough in our work in terms of establishing a foundation that is solid and based in Indigenous philosophy around HIV. So our traditional medicines and teachings have been uh, a part of our journey all the way along. And in 1990, Myra brought the name to Spirit to us at our third gathering of American gays and lesbians. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of, you know, uncertainty about this name, what it truly means. But my point of view now is uh, for many generations, as two spirit people, as queer indigenous people, entirely from our uh, identities, from our cultures, from our traditions, and uh, they they try to uh, you know obliterate us, and so it's not surprising in our decolonization and reconciliation that uh, we receive a, a name from the spiritual world. And our name is about our spirituality, a uh, spirituality that predates colonization, a life philosophy and a worldview that predates colonization, a relationship to the natural world that all Indigenous people have, and from that uh, teachings about strength and knowledge and uh, integrity. And so, you know, uh, we didn't just get one spirit when we came back. We got two. And I like to think I have one spirit for, you know, shopping and one spirit for cleaning the house. And, you know, people really get caught up in this gender identity around the two-spirit name. But we should be, you know, aware that, you know, in our rebirth, in this decolonization and this resurgence, is that we carry a spiritual name. Uh, and it's not uh, couched in Western philosophy or a colonial society. It comes from our traditions, from the spiritual world. And so now today, um, uh, we're moving forward. We're breaking down barriers uh, that uh, have silenced our voice around sexual health uh, for two-spirit people. And that, you know, uh, sexual health is about sexual energy. It's about nurturing and loving each other. And there is no shame uh, regarding two-spirit sexual health. And it has to be a part of the conversation, you know, for uh, gay men, bisexual men, lesbian women, trans people, intersex people, or even asexual people. We have to break down those barriers of, uh, you know, uh, fear about talking about how we got to be created in the first place. You know, people had to have sex. So, uh, and we have the traditionalists and the knowledge keepers who are starting to share that knowledge with us, who are bringing back the old legends that we're not shy about uh, human sexuality. They predate colonization and they gave us a path, a path to reach to the, speak to the new generation about the diversity of humans, right? the diversity of sexual behavior, sexual 
uh, identities that predates colonization. So we have all of this knowledge that we could tap to tap into in the future, you know, for our youth in the coming generations. And I see that today with our two spirit youth, who are you know bringing their gifts forward uh, without shame, without fear. And uh, Roger Roulette, who is an Ojibwe language specialist, tells us that all humans have a purpose, a role, and a destiny, a predetermined destiny by the natural world. And we all carry divine gifts or a gift, right? And we see that every day among our two-spirit youth who are writers and singers and dancers and making films and uh, advocates, you know. A lot of them are at the forefront of, you know, uh, uh, you know, of this resource extraction, whether it's oil, you know, uh, mining uh, and those kind of things. It is two-spirit youth. Maybe that's their gift to be a, a shit disturber or an activist, right? And it's part of their destiny. So we need to honor all of those things and, uh, and you know, not forget that, you know, this uh, journey of HIV has brought us this far. And there's a lot more uh, further that we will go in uh, decolonizing, uh, you know, North America. So thank you, everybody. Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. McLeod, for those uh, amazing words and sentiments when it comes to activism here in our country and honestly the true impact of colonization uh, on our indigenous worldview of, of gender and, and sexuality and how it is much different from what was uh, and is imposed upon these lands. Um, and just on a, on a quick side note, I was a witness yesterday giving a statement to the Standing Committee on Justice and Human Rights regarding Bill C-6 and conversion therapy uh, just yesterday and reiterating the fact that colonization, the reason why we're in such harm's way is because, because of that, is because of colonization and, and these um, binary aspects and, and heteronormative and cisnormative uh, narratives that are trying to be imposed upon our peoples when in actuality, you know, we just like everyone. You know? <laughs> Awesome, and thank you so much, Dr. Albert. I look forward to uh, hearing some of your comments uh, as we move into the question portion. But without further ado, I'd love to be able to introduce our next presenter, uh, a good friend of mine, a jazzy friend of mine, who's a really good dancer, by the way. Uh, I don't know if Martin knows that, but you are really good at dancing. Uh, but Martin Moorberg is a two-spirit Indigenous HIV activist born and raised in the Yukon Territory. Uh, his motivational speeches have been heard in many Indigenous communities throughout Canada and internationally at the United Nations and World AIDS Conference. It is Martin's goal to empower the lives and voices of Two-Spirit and Indigenous peoples affected by HIV and AIDS and addictions while contributing to the visibility of these communities. This is what led Martin to, uh, number one, be an amazing director, and number two, create A Mile in Our Moccasins, which was uh, filmed in, and finished in 2017, and to create and produce HIV or uh, Healing Inner Voices. Uh, so without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to my jazzy friend here, Martin, who, uh, you know, I, I love you, man, as we can see. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Martin Marburg. I am Northern Toshone and Clinket, and I was born and raised in the Yukon Territory. Um, the clan that I was given by my mother is Doc Lawady, and that is the Eagle and Killer Whale Crest. Um, the Clinket name that my grandmother gave me is Yucca Kwan, and that translates to uh, Frosty Face. Uh, which makes a lot of sense because I'm from the Yukon Territory where it's really cold. Um, yeah, and I belong to the First Nation of Nachonaik Dan. Um, I identify as a two-spirit man. Um, I am also HIV positive. I've been living with HIV for eight and a half years now. And um, yeah, so I think it's really important for me to acknowledge the land that I work uh, study and live on. So I'm here on the traditional and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh uh, nations, the Coast Salish people here 
also known as Vancouver, BC. Good morning, it's about 8.30. Um, also, I'd really like to acknowledge uh, the leaders uh, that have come before me, uh, both in the Two-Spirit community and the HIV AIDS community. I also really want to recognize um, the fight that had to take place and, and all of the social justice um, efforts and, you know, the blood, sweat and tears and, and the many people that, that were lost and, and, and taken because of uh, the AIDS epidemic. And so I just really want to uh, recognize um, the leaders that have, have blazed the trail for, for younger people like me, um, you know, to, to come forward and, and to start uh, contributing to the HIV field, the, the Indigenous HIV field, uh, both here in Vancouver and around Canada. So, um, yeah, like Jack mentioned, I, I guess <laughs> I'm an Indigenous filmmaker and, and kind of what that is all about is I just really wanted to create platforms um, for Indigenous people uh, living with or affected by HIV to come forward and to use um, their stories and to use their voices and, and to really share their power and, uh, and to be able to present that to our Indigenous communities uh, to both educate and to kind of awaken compassion and, and really raise community awareness of, of what it's like for, you know, Indigenous people um, living with HIV and, and the realities that we face and, you know, what, like what, what made us vulnerable to um, HIV infection. Uh, also, just to share a little like uh, personal experience just with um, the Two-Spirit identity so, you know, I was raised in a, in a really rural kind of remote community of like four or 500 people. And so when I was a little boy, um, you know, I, I, was, I was a really feminine child and, and there was times where I was often with the girls and, and I was, I was uh, really confused at that time and, and thought that I was supposed to be born a girl because I didn't have any sort of role models or anyone um, like two spirited around me that could teach me that that this was okay that that I can grow into a two spirit identity, and so very quickly uh, within my own family and you know within the community, I was I was shamed as a child. I was I was shamed for being that feminine child. I was shamed for presenting as a girl you know, at the age of five years old and, and, I, and I was just a little guy, you know, and, and so I remember asking, you know, my mother, like if, like why, why I wasn't born a girl and, and it was only until later throughout puberty that I had discovered what it meant to be gay and, and it was in that discovery where I thought I found somewhat of an identity and you know just just the bullying that took place and and just this really kind of like alienation and you know uh the loneliness and kind of desperation that i felt at a really young age you know um you know just being uh excluded and and not really being able to find my place and so when i was old enough you know i had this idea um as a as like an 18 year old is you know, I'm going to run away to the city and, and I'm going to find this connection and, and I'm going to find community and, and I'm going to find acceptance. And, and, you know, and so I did, I ran to the city and I was just this lost child kind of looking for his identity. And, you know, I, I, I got into the, to the gay scene and, and I found that it was really difficult for me to find identity it was, I was trying to mold myself and change myself and, and, and trying to become something that I thought people would accept, that I thought people would connect with, that I thought I could be a part of a community. And, and it was a really rude awakening to find that, that there was a lot of stigma even within those gay communities. And so, you know, it, it, it didn't take long for me um, to become vulnerable you know, to things like violence, um, addiction, uh, you know, sexually transmitted infections, you know, HIV and, you know, injection drug use and, and sex work and, 
and there was just like a lot of things that that I was dealing with and and traumas that were passed on to me and, and patterns that were taking place um, throughout my addiction and and so it was really only in like the destruction of myself and it was only when I completely destroyed myself that I was actually able to find community and I really believe that I was really humbled into a position where you know I was I was almost forced to seek and and what I was seeking was was ceremony and and that connection to culture and that connection to spirit and and that connection to to other people living with HIV and so you know when I got into those communities I was just this young you know, rookie and, and I, I couldn't say my, my diagnosis out loud. And, and I started to meet other people that were living with HIV or that were affected by HIV. And it was really like the love and the nourishment of these two spirit community members and of these HIV positive community members that really empowered me. You know, they really nurtured me and, and I'm a really strong believer in kind of the oral history of Indigenous people of how they've used storytelling um, as knowledge transfer. And so, you know, I, I presented at some CAN conferences and, and I got to meet some really, really amazing people. And, you know, I, I started getting all of these different opportunities to travel to all of these forums and events and conferences. And, and what was happening at those conferences is I was hearing these stories. I was I was seeing all of this really important and amazing work being done. And, and I really started to find myself. I started to find my identity. And, and I'm just so grateful, you know, for, for the two spirit identity because it was it was almost in desperation that I was latching on to something to empower me to love me, to help me feel accepted, to help me feel like I was a part of a community. And, and that was the two spirit people that gave me that. And I was really fortunate to have, you know, some teachers and leaders that, that really reached their hands down to me and, and they pulled me out of the dark. And um, so, yeah, like once I was, you know, really being nurtured and, and empowered, that's when the, that creativity started to come to me. And, and that's when, you know, all of these stories started to come to me and all of these teachings and ceremonies and elders. And, you know, it was, it was, that was my inspiration to get into the work that I do today. And so, you know, I would go home and I would go back to the drawing board and I would say, you know, like, there's all of these amazing stories in our communities and, and why aren't they being heard? You know, like I'm being asked to sit on all these boards and committees, but, but where are the voices of the community? And so it was really important to me that, that the voices of this, um, these communities were being heard. And so I really wanted to contribute to the visibility. And, and it, it, was, it was as if they loved me and naturally a responsibility came to me to pay forward what was given to me, the identity that was given to me, the tools that were given to me. I felt an obligation and a responsibility to be that example for other young Two-Spirit people and, and to really give them opportunities to facilitate, to present, you know, to, to coordinate and to really lift them up in their voices and in their power. And so the result was um, the films that I had created. And, and I'll just, you know, kind of reiterate what that's about is, is it's really a platform for, for these two-spirit and HIV positive people and people that have really broken through barriers who, who have grown in the face of adversity, you know, like in, in systems that are designed to oppress us and marginalize us and you know, this systemic racism. And, and so, you know, there was so many people that I was meeting that, that were, you know, empowering and, and that have broken through these systems and, and they were woke, you know, like they, they taught me. And so I just really wanted to give community members an opportunity to use their voices and, and to really empower them. And so I, I created um, these platforms and, you know, it's, I guess what, what the reward for me is, and 
uh, kind of the spiritual reward is that, you know, witnessing these community members coming forward and, and being empowered and, and, you know, having the courage to speak their truth and, and the courage to share and, and, and be vulnerable enough, um, you know, to, to show our communities that, that this is what it's like, like th this is our reality. And, you know, like to think of a human being to have to defend their very existence based on gender, based on sexuality, based on indigenous identity, you know, based on their HIV status, like, you know, it's it, it's difficult and, it, and it's traumatizing. And, you know, like a lot of what the teachers taught me, um, you know, within the community is that two-spirit people had a place in our communities. And, and yes, colonization did take that from us. You know, the Roman Catholic Church coming here telling us, you know, this is a man and, and this is the role he is to play and this is what's acceptable. And, and this is a woman and, you know, this is her role and this is what's acceptable. And, and if we don't fit that cookie cutter role, then shame is placed on us you know, and, and like our language is lost and the cultural genocide and, you know, just the many, many issues that we face. And so one thing that we really like to highlight in our projects is yes, we have the, you know, the, the honesty and the vulnerability and, and the exposing of our fragility of, of this is the dark place that we've come from. And, and this was the shame and the intersection of stigmas that was placed on us, you know, but then we go on to share, this is how, you know, we've healed from these things. This is our resiliency. This is, this is the, you know, the DNA of my ancestors running through my blood. Like this is me as a two spirit indigenous person living with HIV and, and sharing those stories of, of strength and resiliency and, and stepping into our own power and, and helping our communities and, and really finding our place as two-spirit people. And then we go to show them, this is the barriers that we've broken through. This is how we've been empowered. This is how we've healed. And this is what we're, this is a place that we're in in our communities now. And so really it's, it's kind of a trajectory of, of yes, that's what it was like. And, and this is what we've done and, and this is how far we've come. And, and we, I just, and I think that is the contribution to the visibility is that it's not all sunshine and rainbows, but we can heal, we can be resilient, we can break through these things. And then we can use that, you know, to help and empower our communities. So I think, yeah, like it's, it's just really, for me, it's, I don't think about it as a career. Like I go to school, I work different jobs. This is really a part of my life that that is a spiritual kind of thing for me. And, and it's a responsibility and, and it's a purpose. And I really keep it separate from my professional life. And, uh, you know, to really just use that as, you know, this is what I've been given. And, and I'll just I'll just end with this is that when I got onto the red road and, and I, I removed all of the substances from my life five years ago, you know, I was really angry. I was really angry of, you know, why did I have to be gay? You know, why did I have to be paused? Like, why, why did I have to experience all of these things as a child? And, and why was all this intergenerational trauma and shame and fear and, and all of this placed on me? And I was angry, you know, and, and so it was through my own healing processes of, of 12 step programs of, you know, um, and deal, like um, getting into ceremony and, and learning from leaders and that I was empowered enough, um, you know, to start presenting in community to empowering other people and to taking other people into ceremony and, you know, getting an opportunity to present on international platforms. And it's like my questions of why were being answered for me. You know, it, it would come to me and it was almost as if it was a whisper to me of like, this is why, this is why, because 
it's given you a purpose. Everything that you've endured and everything that you've survived and everything that you've broken through has put you in a position in your two-spirit community to be that responsible community member, you know, to pass on what was given to you. You know, so it was really that two spirit and HIV and indigenous communities that gave that to me. They gave me a purpose. They gave me an identity. You know, they they gave me tools to contribute to the community. So I, I will never, ever underestimate, you know, the power of storytelling and the power of contributing to the visibility of our people you know, and the power of planting a seed and, and being an example of resiliency and, and breaking through those things as a two-spirit Indigenous person living with HIV. Um, yeah, so I'll just leave it at that. Uh, it's been a real pleasure um, listening to uh, both Marjorie and our other two-spirit leader, um, I'll, I'm sorry, Dr. Albert McLeod, so thank you for having me, Jack and Janessa. And um, yeah, we can move along. Thank you. Appreciate all of the uh, resiliency and, and the strength that you bring within that. I think it's very important that we, uh, as you're saying, continue to uplift our, our, our two-spirit youth or indigenous youth, and more specifically, our youth who may be living with or affected by uh, HIV in, in whatever form that may be. Uh, it's, it's truly an honor to have you here and to honestly just to have you uh, to, to grace this realm. So thank you so much for all the gifts that you bring. Uh, it truly is uh, an honor to, to work alongside you. So in saying so, uh, our three uh, speakers here, we're going to be moving into our question portion, but I do want to reiterate for our attendees here that we do have a live Q&A portion, which we will be uh, looking to near the end of our formal uh, panel questions. So you can actually look on the bottom of your screen there, you're going to say live Q&A. Uh, button, and that's where you're able to ask the questions specifically to us, and that just helps me be able to ensure that I'm not uh, you know, glossing over any questions, and they're a nice little tool for me to check box off of all of the uh, questions that come in. So, feel, so please feel free to uh, utilize that particular uh, tool there in order to ensure that I'm not uh, missing your questions. So without further ado, Let's let's ask some uh, some Q and A questions here. Huh? <laughs> All right. Can I, just, can I just say something, Jack? Yes. Yes. Go ahead. I think that's how I will have to go first. Now that I've listened to all this wisdom, I really want to thank you, uh, Martin, because the young people have helped me a lot because um, they're stepping up and they're not afraid to be who they are, and they are demanding their inheritance and um, seeking their place in the circle so that they can use their gifts. And one of the, the things that uh, Albert reminded me of that I want to reiterate is that two spirit have stepped up and are taking their place. And what is our job? You know, what is our job, our responsibility in that circle? And I always think about or go back to Alex uh, Wilson's words about coming in instead of coming out to come into that circle and take our place and and to use our gifts and what is our job our responsibility and and to me that's to balance the circle and our circle is so out of whack because our place is not recognized or acknowledged and the more we stand up and take our place like the young people are doing, the stronger the circle will be. And we stand in the middle and we balance, we balance that circle and, and heal that circle. That is, that is the gifts that we bring. And so I thank you for, for sharing your gifts. And as a fellow filmmaker, I, I uh, also uh, use that medicine for, for the same purpose as you to, to have people take their place. I did that that one in Saskatchewan to open those conversations as well, you know, that are coming in stories to take our place with the youth because that is the future. And and I so I'm I'm very grateful that that you are uh, taking yeah. up that, 
that road um, and doing that. That's all. Yeah. Thank you for those kind words and that, that follow up. And it's really nice to hear that we as a two spirit community can continue to uplift each other because that's uh, that's mm -hmm. what we do. You know where our strength is our resiliency through all of these generations even before colonization and i think it just goes to show the uh, the people within this room right now and the folks who uh unfortunately were not able to join us where uh where we're, we're uh, evidence that assimilation that colonization that these tactics uh have never worked nor will they ever work you know we we are this the spirit of our ancestors and the spirit of these teachings, um, more specifically two spirit teachings. So it's uh, it's just all a good feel. <laughs> right. um, but without further ado, how about we uh, we'll jump into some questions here in regards to our formal uh, panel aspect. Uh, I'm going to uh, maybe combine these uh, the first question or questions. Uh, so number one, this is a two part. What does Aboriginal AIDS Awareness Week mean for you? And second to that, what might be missing when looking at HIV and AIDS activism within Indigenous communities? Uh, maybe I'll jump over to uh, Dr. McLeod here to start us off, and then we'll, uh, we'll go over to uh, Marjorie. Yeah, part of uh, Aboriginal AIDS Awareness Week here in Manitoba, especially Winnipeg, has been around destigmatizing HIV, AIDS, and then testing uh, we worked with the Aboriginal Health and Wellness Center at the Niganan Center, which is uh, an indigenous, uh, uh, huge organizational building on Maine and Higgins. And uh, last year, uh, for the last two years, we've been doing uh, different HIV testing technology on uh, during Aboriginal AIDS Awareness Week with the help of the clinic there at the Aboriginal Health and Wellness Center. This year, we were not able to do it because of the pandemic, but um, uh, last year, we uh, had um, three different types of HIV tests available, uh, and we usually get 100 people come through the atrium that day, and it's a full-day event where we have food and speakers and, and that kind of thing. And um, so what we did is we separated out uh, the three different tests. One was the standard blood draw test that most people are familiar with. The second one is the dry blood uh, spot test. Uh, that can also, you know, detect uh, hepatitis C and other STIs as well as HIV. And then the third one was the rapid HIV test where you know within, you know, two minutes whether it reacts uh, to the antibodies. And so uh, we did that for two years now. And uh, hopefully next year in 2021, it'll be different. Uh, we'll be able to promote this new technology uh, to the Indigenous community. So it's enabled us to partner with Indigenous community organizations and the Indigenous public community to be aware that these tests are available. And we now have uh, in Canada rolling out the uh, HIV self-test uh, kits that will be uh, available across Canada in 2021. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you very much for that. Marjorie, we'll uh, go to the same uh, two questions to yourself. What does Aboriginal AIDS Awareness mean to you and what might be missing when looking at HIV and AIDS activism within Indigenous communities? Oh, well, uh, I have trouble when it comes down to these weeks, you know, that we're supposed to, that's when we're supposed to talk about it. And um, to me, it has I mean, looking at Saskatchewan is one of the hardest places to be when it comes to HIV AIDS and to destigmatize is still part of the big part of the work year round. It's not just one week. And the week would work if we had buy-in from our leadership, like, uh, and, and at the community level as well. I mean, it, there's no uh, ongoing resources for that kind of education at a, uh, community level and a team that could go out, you know, a van that could be like a visibility that's just not there uh, yet, at least not in Saskatchewan. I haven't seen much and I'm, I'm not involved in the work on a day to day basis now. I live in Duck Lake and I'm not involved in the city or in the communities that much, but on this, but it's, it's just frustrating to me when 
you know, I see uh, people that, okay, they've just been diagnosed. Where do they go? Where do they get support? And it's just not, uh, if you're not in a city where, you know, what happens? Uh, you're, you're holding that ball on your own. And so that aid of awareness week for me has to be much more adopted by the leadership and promoted. I mean, how can it be that we have the, these kinds of uh, realities in Saskatchewan and it's not really taken seriously by our own leadership and by the, the provincial government. And, and uh, so we're up against the wall here. Uh, so the week, I don't know if it does any good um, here. Like, I really don't know. I have not seen much uh, and not being involved in, in it on a day to day. I, as a community person, I really haven't seen a whole lot except on social media. So uh, I'm, I'm open to, to, to hearing what, what can be done, but it's up to each person to get involved. But I mean, we need to push that leadership and put those questions out there. Uh, for those points and when it comes to accessibility uh, of testing and you know follow-up peer support or, or peer navigation I think that's a huge gap not only within the province of Saskatchewan here but I suspect in other places uh, and more specifically in rural parts of Canada uh, it would be interesting to see what we could create because quite often these uh, initiatives uh, are started by the community uh, so thank you very much for those uh, those insights there, Marjorie. Mm -hmm. uh, Martin, would you mm -hmm. like to uh, hop in in regards to what Aboriginal AIDS Day, or sorry, what Aboriginal AIDS Awareness Week means for you, and what might be missing when it comes to HIV and AIDS activism within Indigenous communities? I think um, what Aboriginal AIDS Awareness Week means to me is it's a time that we can really come together and you know have these really. Um, kind of important and really much needed um, conversation around how Indigenous people are affected by HIV and really being able to raise that uh, community awareness. Um, yeah, w w when it comes to things, what I think is missing is, is definitely the accessibility, especially to the Indigenous people living in remote and rural communities within Canada. And, you know, that being said is, is um, you know, what sort of like access do they have to things like peers and, and to self-test kits and, and to really, you know, um, be educated and, and, and given knowledge enough to, to be able to protect themselves and, and to really nurture themselves. And so I think that's kind of like a really big gap um, that's happening is just the, the actual accessibility. And, you know, there's there's some communities where I'm from where, you know, HIV is, is kind of the far beyond, you know, like nobody's really, um, it's, it's not in the forefront of, of any of the issues that are being addressed uh, within the Yukon territory. And so I think, you know, there is a really long way um, for them to go. I think another thing that was really taken from our community and, and from a lot of different organizations is, is the recent cuts in funding that, that have happened uh, from the federal government. And, you know, um, I, guess, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that um, it was the gatherings and the support and the nourishment from the community that really contributed to my health and wellness. And, and now it's really boiling down to, here's your medication, here's your doctor's appointment, you know, here is prep, here is a test, and that's what we're given, you know, and, and the complexity of HIV and, and what makes us vulnerable to it is, is, is um much more vast than one pill than than one prep pill than than one test than one doctor's appointment right if if we think about you know like this looking at it in like a medicine wheel kind of perspective i mean that really is only taking part of a really or taking care of a really small part of the physical quadrant 
but if we're thinking about mental, spiritual, emotional, it's, it's where is that nourishment coming from, right? And so I really believe that, you know, um, in grassroots, in, in community-based projects, and, you know, um, working, you know, even on an individual basis to, to get those conversations going, to, to even have a small impact or, or to turn the light on for somebody or, you know, to be a resource for someone. And, and so I think Aboriginal AIDS Awareness Week is a time where we can go public with these things. But, you know, what are we doing for the other what is it 51 weeks of the year and 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 how am i contributing to that right and so i i really take that seriously of you know being a, a resource for people um you know who who might not be as fortunate as i was um to to have the experiences that i've had within the community so you know i would just really like to encourage people to to really be that resource and and recognize the people that that are doing that really important work. Hey, hey thank you very much for those uh, those insights in regards to the grassroots aspect. You know, as as we've we've heard throughout this morning, a lot of the work does come uh, by the people for the people. But then, when we don't necessarily have the resources to be able to honor those gifts that the people bring i mean there, there's only so much that we can do so uh, I, I do agree that the funding cuts are a huge detriment to our communities uh, but we, we fill in wherever we can you know as uh, as two-spirit folks we're, uh, you know, we're we're known as the original escapios and we will continue to help out where wherever we, we may be able to but you know we do need we do need that support from our 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 chiefs, our bands, our you know governments, uh, both municipally, provincially, and federally to to do this work. So thank you very much for that one. We are getting some uh, really interesting uh, discussion aspects within the discussion forum as well. So I just want to remind the attendees that we do have a discussion forum in there, but. Here is a nice little way for our attendees to also participate. We're going to ask y'all some questions. Uh, so on the bottom of your screen, attendees, I just want to bring your attention to the live polling section. It should say live poll. Now we are going to go to our very first evaluation question, which uh, if you were to click on that live poll, you're going to see on your right hand side of your screen that uh, there are some questions that you're going to be able to um, uh, put your two cents on. Uh, so one of the very first ones is how much do you know about the TRC or MMIW uh, G2S calls to action? So this particular question, polling question to your to attendees, leads us very nicely into our second question, which will be posed to our panelists. So uh, Martin, I'm going to tag you in first. Uh, sorry, can you repeat that? Oh, sorry, I was just about to question. I was just about to ask the question. Uh, okay. Yeah, no problem. Uh, so, Martin, when considering the TRC calls to action and the MMIW G2S calls to action, what calls stand out for you when looking at HIV activism? <laughs> I know this is a very large question. <laughs> that is yeah. a really large and kind of open. I don't know, like I can, uh, I don't know if I was the best person to pick first. Yeah, um, that's okay. I, I, I guess I could just share like um, a little bit of experience that I've had in, in kind of working in, in non-Indigenous communities and, and kind of what that's looked like is, you know, there, there seems to be, um, some trends happening uh, within the younger communities. And you see a lot of, of hashtags of, of BIPOC and, and QPOC and Black and Indigenous people of color. And, you know, you these people coming together and these social justice fighters. And, and so I, I think it's really important, um, especially for me within any sort of activism that, that I've done that, that I realize, you know, that people that have come and, and the people that have really gotten uh, and, and felt the wrath of like those 
kind of trauma and, and, and the things that they have to survive. Like it isn't this trendy thing to be like BIPOC or Cuban or, or two spirit people. It's, it's really important for me to recognize kind of where that comes from and, and the people and the events and, and, and the fighters and the survivors that really had to take place in order for us to get where we are today. So I think there's a, a lot of um, knowledge transfer that can happen between you know the younger generation and the survivor generation where we are today. And so, um, you know, that being said, like I think that there is awareness happening. You know, people are waking up, and and this younger generation is is becoming aware, is becoming aware of you know systemic racism and and, and a lot of the intergenerational impacts that we deal with. And you know, like like and it's 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 nice to see um non-indigenous people kind of recognize the privilege that they have within our systems that were built by their ancestors i mean they're still benefiting from the structures that were created by their ancestors that were designed to to kill the indian within us you know and so I think that being said too is like I mean I can't I can't touch on a lot of it. Um, I'm still very much a student in, in a lot of these areas, but one thing that I will say is that it's it's been a real challenge to 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 sit in a position in the community where I'm working with community and then I'm working with colonial structures and, and granting processes and funders and, and researchers and academics. It's, it's they, they come to us with these frameworks and these structures giving us the idea that they have the solution, that they have what we need and that they're gonna come in and, and you know, implement these into our communities and, and, and teach us how to live. And it's like, we're in a place now where, you know, this resurgence and, and this reclamation and, and this identity and, and, and going back to culture and, and that's really happening. This, it's, it's, it's a phenomenon that's, that's happening um, in a lot of communities throughout Canada where, you know, this reclamation is taking place. And so often I find, it, I, I try and stay really true to the community-based to the peer led, to the indigenous led projects that I work on. And so when I'm working in that community and I'm, I, we're creating collectively a vision um, and then having to present that to grantors, it's like, oh, this is where we can stick research in and, and oh, this is what it can look like. And oh, have you thought of this? And oh, can you do this? And, and then they, they, there's been times where I've been tokenized and there's been times where I've been, they've tried to relay our vision to their teams of, of these professionals and, and it's lost in translation. Our, our peer led grassroots vision is lost in translation. And so I've, I've had to do it where I've had to, you know, it was that resistance of no, this is peer led. This is a community based thing. We are, we are not doing this research. And, and really having to call a spade a spade in, in a setting where that's not socially acceptable. And I think one thing that I've learned, um, especially being raised by an indigenous woman is, is getting to the point and, and stating facts and stating the truth. You know, there's, there's none of this beating around the bush, speaking a language that, that isn't mine indigenously you know, I'm just going to come out and tell you and call a spade a spade. And this is a colonial structure and, and this is oppressive and, and this is not working in our communities. And so, I mean, that's kind of the only experience that I've had is that I think it's really time, you know, for non-Indigenous people to sit down and listen, you know, and, and, and to recognize themselves as allies and and that this isn't a trend that this isn't something that's in style you know this is these are the lives 
of Indigenous people, and and this is a reclamation that's taking place within our communities. So, um, I'll leave it at that. I'm really excited to hear uh, what both of our elders have to say. So I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll go over to uh, to Auntie Albert here, so you can go warm up your toast after your your answer. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so when considering the TRC calls to action and the MMIW uh, to uh, G2S calls to action, what stands out for you when it comes to HIV and AIDS activism? Um, and if I may uh, further ask this to, to yourself, uh, specifically to, 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 to Albert and Marjorie, is what about like two-spirit peoples within these calls? Yeah, I think uh, for myself, uh, with the TRC, uh, which is really about the impact of Indian residential schools, um, that um, one of the critiques I have is, is that it didn't, uh, in this opportunity, dismantle the binary gender that was imposed on Indigenous people. But I understand that, you know, after many generations, it was so entrenched uh, in the leaders of this, uh, they didn't have that view uh, of of pre-contact ideas about gender diversity. So it wasn't a focus or important to do. And again, they had been in Indian residential schools where the binary was uh, normalized. So I was kind of disappointed in this in that opportunity, but the uh, uh, 231 calls for justice uh, did do that in a way in that they sort of uh, expanded the indigenous, uh, the language around what constitutes an Indigenous women, woman from an a Indigenous point of view and included Two-Spirit and trans people in that definition. So there was some movement in terms of that decolonization process in, in these commissions and inquiries. Now, the one of the TRC that stands out for me is number 22, which talks about changing the healthcare system to value Aboriginal healing practices. And again, it is about, uh, you know, for the colonial state, which is very structured around secularism, supposedly, but really is, is uh, fueled by Euro-Christian uh, bias uh, within the healthcare and, you know, other systems, even though they won't fess up to that. Uh, and that's that sort of tension with the judicial knowledge and healing. And so there's a, a lack of funding for these services, even though for Indigenous people, we know they work. And I just want to give you an example. Uh, a colleague of mine had HIV for over 20 years and was in the end stage, you know, the ARV, the antiretrovirals were failing him. And, uh, and so the doctor said, well, you know, we're just going to put him on maintenance antiretrovirals and he's not going to live much longer. And uh, a nurse, an uh, Indigenous nurse, um, took him to a Sundat ceremony. And, uh, you know, he came to the tree and they did the healing. The dancers did their healing with the fans. And this man lived another 10 years. And so that's an example when you do not acknowledge the power of indigenous healing in a Western medical model, you know, the doctor was uh, ready to write him off. Uh, and that doctor didn't have that uh, understanding. And so this, my friend lived another 10 years, uh, went back up north and died on his reserve, which I knew was something he wanted. So, so that's what I mean. That's that's kind of the tensions that we need to break through. In that, we don't have to convince Western healers that our medicine works. We know it works. They just have to fund it so we can practice it, right? Uh, here, funded by our health authority in Winnipeg, uh, the healer is only funded to come two days a month. And we have 94,000 Indigenous people in Winnipeg. That's the disparity. That is uh, racism. That's discrimination, right? That our, we only have access to that healer two days out of a month. So, so those are the battles that we have to take. And, uh, you know, uh, I think COVID is really identifying a lot of these gaps and systemic racism that exists in our, in our systems around Indigenous people. That's where our battle is going to be. Thank you very much for that, uh, Dr. McLeod. We're going to go to uh, Elder uh, Marjorie here 
when considering the TRC calls to actions and the MMIWG US uh, calls to justice, what calls stand for uh, out for you when looking at HIV activism? And more specifically, what about two spirit peoples with these comments? Oh, I have a lot of trouble with the TRC uh, calls to action, like in a lot of levels, but who is being called to action exactly? You know, this is all framed in the colonial government terms. And like, what I want is a call to action in our communities with our knowledge keepers that we do the work of digging through the colonial trash and putting our truth and our ways forward, like Albert was saying, that that and have the resources to make it happen it's the land and the language you know that are are the healers and we're in a place to to do uh these ceremonies and gatherings for everybody and and it's so limited like we haven't we haven't got that capacity yet that's been developed in our own communities we are there it's there, but it's so buried under that colonial trash that we have become powerless in executing them in, in a daily basis. Like every community should have a wellness center and where people could come in and feel safe and do art and share stories and do ceremony and, and everything would change. And it's like, there's so many divisions between that Christian world and our worldview that that has to be bridged and what is our job as as two spirit I, I find that my work has been to be bridging that gap to stand in the middle between these worlds and to and to hold them so that they can talk to each other and find a way through because as long as we stay in separate worlds these calls to action are not going to happen i don't see the police i don't see the churches all these people that are out there, you know, stepping up to, to change or to make these things happen. I don't see governments doing that. I, I, and I think we're, and the people are so used to waiting for those dollars and hands out, you know, for the dependent, you know, the dependent on government money. But we have a lot of resources that don't need money. You know, we have the land. We have the ceremonies, we have the medicine. So it's like, we have to pull it together. And I just get tired sometimes uh, of seeing people stuck and and uh, not taking action on their own behalf. Our call to action is a call for us to be self-governing. It's a call for us to stand up and take responsibility and, and to, to do what we have in us to do like uh, Albert was saying earlier, that we all have a purpose. And and so what is our purpose in this matter? It's, it's unconditional love. It's harm reduction is unconditional love and not judgment. And so to continue to break down that, that judgment and that, and that fear and, and get, break through those walls that the church has built, that is what the call to action is for me and it doesn't we can't wait for the government or for for the society around us to do it because it's not going to happen they don't give a <laughs> they just yeah, don't. fill in the blank there <laughs> <hey>. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, or rat -tap. is it rat -tap? yeah <laughs> yeah yeah that's right all yeah, of the above. above well hey hey thank you very much for those uh uh raw raw words when it comes to the challenges that we're facing as a two-spirit community and more specifically when it comes to the calls to action and calls to justice and how these particular lenses when they were first started to, uh, unfortunately did not necessarily incorporate two-spirit voices uh within those and only retroactively uh incorporated uh community members which would be you know two-spirit community members um I think it's uh, just a, a quick little side note. When I was at the standing committee yesterday, uh, talking about conversion therapy, that was one of the biggest points that I that we needed to get across was the fact that conversion therapy is only in place in Canada due to colonialism and the malicious 
malicious mm-hmm. use of religion and the way that we uh, deem what the proper quote unquote human experience is and how within our larger society, that's what we're trying to, that's, that's what it's trying to uphold is that one mentality when in actuality we as indigenous people and more specifically two spirit people understood that we're all unique, mm-hmm. we're all diverse uh, and we all deserve uh, to live free, full and fulfilling lives. Um, so I think so. I'm going to toss this back to the attendees. So get ready, attendees. We're going to open up the second half of this particular polling question. Uh, so feel free to go over to your live polling section. Uh, so I know this was a little bit of a lead in, into this. So we kind of gave, gave you something to chew on as you're looking at uh, the poll. And, but it, uh, for attendees, please go ahead and go over to there and answer, do you believe the concepts within these documents are being utilized or upheld? Um, but in saying so, uh, I'm going to circle back to the first polling question that stated, how much do you know about the TRC and MMIWG2S calls to action? Uh, 5% said just the TRC, 14% said just the MMIWG2S, uh, 24% said very little, and a large amount, uh, that being 57% of our attendees, said that they do not uh, know enough about either. So it just also goes to show that our larger push when it comes to the awareness of these calls to actions and calls to justice are are not out there for the general public. So feel free to uh, participate in the second portion of the live poll. But in saying so, we're now going to move into our third question for our panelists here. Uh, uh, All right, so Marjorie, if you would like to go up first. I will ask the impacts of racism within healthcare have been highlighted quite widely for people who were non-Indigenous this past year. In your experiences and interactions, how has the landscape for Indigenous peoples, uh, when you first started uh, your activi- activism for HIV and AIDS, uh, how, how was it and how has it changed? Oh, that's a tough one. <laughs> Racism, it's the biggest epidemic we face here in Saskatchewan. Uh, It's always been there. It's an underground current and then it rears up its ugly head. And it has become more so in the last few years that that people seem to think they have permission to, to be racist now that they didn't have before. Like they were, it was hidden but now it's right out there out in the open and it's accepted and acceptable behavior. And I find that really scary that that people getting away with all that that uh, hate uh, and and uh, and we're the the people that are suffering the most because of it are the ones that that are hurting the most already. So um it's, uh, I find it hard to, uh, I mean, everything is being uh, accentuated and even more with, with uh, the land struggles, the water, you know, people, are, the, the ecological imbalances, the loss of our relationship to all these things, it, that's part of the racism too. And people don't understand and still don't want to know. Um, some people are doing the work, but like uh, mostly I said to people like in the anti-colonial frame of reference, it's like when you don't know anything about our worldview, how can you judge us? Because it's really about world views colliding and you know if you can't come and sit in the circle with us or dance in the circle with us or come to ceremony with us you'll never know who we are and and uh, that bridge again is not there for a lot of people they just uh they stay in separate worlds and and uh so how do how to I'm tired of educating people. Uh, do I did anti-racism work for many, 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 many years, and I realized, you know what? 
it's not going to change. They don't need to change. They just want to feel good. And and I don't do any more of those uh, one shot deals. You know, no more one one night stands. Uh, <laughs> it's it's uh, you have to engage on a long term basis and make relations. That's the bottom line. You have to make relations, and that's hard work. And that means having hard conversations. And and uh, that's how we're going to change is having different relationships either have a, a divorce and say, okay, you go your way, I go mine, or we join together and make it different. But it, it's all about relationship. And if you don't have a relationship, then don't come to me and ask me to do a blessing for some meeting of yours. You know, like, uh, I don't even know you. So so how can you, you ask me how to, to, to come and do this for you? I, I have no connection to you. And and so let's make connections first, and then maybe we'll talk about doing other things. But it's like making relations. If you don't have relations, then there's no real partnership. There's no real commitment, uh, you know, to grow together or to change anything. So that racism health place is uh, that's where it starts for me. Thank you, Marjorie. I don't know if I answered the question, but uh, I hate going for. <laughs> That's all right. Thank you. Yeah, the uh, respectful reciprocal relationships are of the utmost importance when we're looking at dealing with uh, breaking down racialized uh, discriminatory practices. Hmm. Um, so we're yeah. we're going to uh, then move over to uh, Dr. McLeod when it comes to the impacts of racism within healthcare. Uh, that have been highlighted this past year in your experiences and interactions, how has the landscape for Indigenous people, how did it, I suppose, start, or what was it looking like when you first started your activism with HIV, and how has it changed over the years? Well, I don't think it's changed that much. As I mentioned, you know, I think it was through our uh, stepping up to the plate early on that we've mitigated the number of HIV cases, AIDS cases in Canada among Indigenous people. Uh, but I think the system hasn't kept up with us, as we know, you know, with the content of uh, the events this week. You know, we have uh, the Fee Center, uh, we have the Waniska Center around HIV and STIs getting funded to begin to do this work on a massive scale. And it is through, you know, the work that we've done over the last 30 years. But I just want to talk about this idea. And Angela Davis, who is a well-known uh, African-American activist from the 60s. So she's part of the Black Panthers. So she spoke in Winnipeg a couple of years ago. And she said something that really struck me is that in colonization, and in the case of the uh, people who were, you know, taken from Africa, you know, kidnapped from Africa and enslaved in America for the cotton industry, she said there was really no plan post-Civil War for these people to be free, to be equal citizens. And so what's happened since that era is uh, that society has created this uh, group of people who are considered their surplus people, right? They were not, never intentionally meant to be part of that society. And so when there are jobs, when there isn't housing, when there isn't employment, they get criminalized and put into prisons. And the U.S. has the highest, you know, number uh, of uh, imprisoned people of their state uh, among Western countries in the world, right? And I thought this is the same as in Canada. You know, First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people were, were considered surplus people by these systems, right? There's no intention of giving us equality or equity in health. Right. And the data shows it, you know, look at TB consistently numbers over representative among uh, indigenous people. Uh, HIV, you know, uh, health people are blind to the data. It's so normalized, right, that gay men, you know, uh, people of color, indigenous people should be overrepresented in HIV cases that it doesn't have an impact anymore. And I always make a point to people I work with uh, in the health systems. I said, you know, your job is not to monitor epidemics or pandemics. Your job is to prevent them, right? And that's what I see in Canada. You know, people who are professionals, trained 
you know, decades of training and experience in the healthcare system who are, are blind to the data and they see the numbers jumping off the page and they're disempowered or not able to move the needle, not able to solve it, right? Uh, and, I, you know, uh, Manitoba had the second highest rate of HIV transmission in Canada for a number of years. Uh, Saskatchewan had the, high, the highest. Uh, and now uh, I think Quebec has replaced Manitoba last year. But, you know, we collect this data for a reason, and it's to prevent illness. And uh, we have healthcare sector who's not doing their job. They're not preventing it. They're just looking at the data every year and just doing the same old thing. Right, and so, so to me, that that really, you know, to me, uh, has to change. Like, um, you know, uh, Chief Teresa Spence, uh, she taught us a lesson about humility when she set her TP up on Victoria Island in I think 2015, and it was it was December, it was winter time, and she asked the Prime Minister of Canada to come and meet with her in her TP, and he wouldn't. You know, he, he did all kinds of contortions, uh, you know, world media, you know, uh, that chief got world attention of world media that here's this uh, First Nations woman sitting in her TV waiting for the Prime Minister of Canada to come and meet with her. And it was about housing in Attawapiskat. And he would not come. And, and she taught us a lesson about colonization is that it was the Indigenous women who help people survive, right? The settlers, food, clothing, you know, uh, teepees. And our prime minister had forgotten that story. And for him to bend, to get into her teepee would have showed that recognition of that history and that relationship with indigenous women in Canada. And he would not do it. And that's what we're talking about is humility. These systems have to bend in humility, not to indigenous people, but to the land that we're living on, the land that has given newcomers this whole lifestyle of privilege, right? And COVID has shown us, you know, uh, how that bubble can burst so easily when we forget this relationship, right? And now we all have to sit in our homes, can't go outside. And so that's what I mean, you know, uh, that, that humility uh, and how we've learned to coexist with the natural world is embedded in our language, our life philosophy, our medicines, our ceremonies, you know, uh, how we relate to each other. And, and that system is not humble enough to open its eyes, open its ears, uh, to be able to implement it. It's still combative and resistant to that. And we're always going to see disease because of that. They will not invest in our traditional way of healing. And, and you know, uh, maybe COVID will change that attitude. But I just see uh, different healthcare systems across Canada digging in their heels, right? So anyway, that's my little diatribe for this. It's new, almost new now. <laughs> Martin, you're going to run over to you when it comes to the impacts of racism within healthcare that have been highlighted this uh, within this past year. Uh, and your experiences, what are the interactions uh, and the landscape like for Indigenous people when you started activism and what have you noticed has changed? I just want to um, start by saying that it's been a real pleasure and a real learning experience to sit on this panel um, with the elders that we have present, just to hear and learn more about kind of the larger scale impacts is just um, it, it's really eye opening and, and I'm just appreciative for for the words that have been shared. Um, I mean, I, I, I can really only um, share from my from my own kind of um, smaller experiences within the healthcare system. And, and, you know, like upon diagnosis, it was it was a really difficult kind of landscape for me to navigate on my own. 
um, you know, because of the shame that I had placed on myself and, and because of my previous experiences in the healthcare system. And, and I remember being assigned a, a general practitioner and, and, you know, not being touched and, and, and being spoken to very coldly and, and having it very cut and dry and, and a lot of pressure put on me by healthcare professionals that, that I had to disclose, that I had to disclose with the people I was living with. I had to disclose to, to my family and, 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 you know, and, and just kind of this, I was just another Indian kid coming into this health clinic, you know what I mean? And, and so, yeah, it was, it was a lot of those really like kind of horrific, traumatizing experiences that happened for me in the beginning and you know like I, I wasn't empowered I wasn't educated I wasn't all of these things I was I was really deprived of of a lot of the knowledge and resources that that should have been and and could have been made available to me and and so like I said like it was really like in the community it was the community um that kind of nourished me and educated me and empowered me and and so I remember going into a doctor's office and, and I was switched doctors when I moved down to Victoria, BC. And, and I sat down with this doctor and, and it was the first time that anybody had ever, <clears throat> that I had ever experienced anything like it. And, and he was asking me, you know, like, what are you eating and, and, and what is your support system like? And, and how are you feeling? And, and what sort of supports do you have in place? And, and how are you sleeping? And, and what's your income like? And he literally was looking at me in a holistic approach. And I cried. I cried because it was the first time that somebody had approached me in that holistic perspective that I wasn't just some Indian kid with HIV, you know? And so that was really encouraging for me. And so, you know, I remember uh, after going back home to the Yukon and, uh, you know, having this, this nurse kind of scoff and, and be really appalled at, at how thick my file was uh, for the, you know, where, where they take blood, it was like a, a blood lab and, you know, and, and there she was um, training a, a practicum student. And so, you know, like how I was going to sit there and allow her to stigmatize me and put shame on me and then teach this practicum student that that's how an Indigenous person is to be treated. And so I approached it in a way that was effective, that was in an education approach. And yeah, and, and, and so I really think it's, it's my own progression throughout being able to navigate the healthcare system. And, you know, there is examples, there is some really shining examples of, you know, people that are doing work on the ground. And I really want to acknowledge that is that there are those outreach workers, there are those harm reduction workers, there are those street outreach workers, those you know, street nurses and, and, you know, peer navigators, you know, like I think uh, Danita, I, I can't pronounce it, Wapuswian in Saskatchewan, she mentioned in the discussion forum, you know, talking about all of these, uh, you know, peer navigator projects that are, that are popping up all over Saskatchewan. And, and so I really think it's important for me and, and for other community members to really to recognize the work that's being done. Because when I was diagnosed, there wasn't a peer navigator. There wasn't anybody that approached me that had lived experience. I literally had to leave the Yukon and go out and find that for myself. And it wasn't provided to me in the healthcare system. It was something that I had to seek outside of the healthcare system. And so I really am a strong believer in, you know, a lot of this peer led involvement and how effective that can be within our healthcare systems. And, you know, just another thing too is, um, yeah, like, I mean, the things that you hear in the media that are just horrific of, of how Indigenous women and, and how Indigenous people are being treated within our healthcare system and, and without getting to like conspiracy theory or whatever, but you know, I, I just think that a big contributor is is we have a media and a social media that is designed to oppress 
those kinds of things. It's like you have all of these indigenous people shouting and shouting and shouting and making these movements. And, and where is it on the news? You know, where, where are these platforms where, where we're able to deliver these things on a wider scale to, to wake people up? And, you know, like it's it's really it's really sad to see things like the George Floyd that took place, you know, in the United States. But but look what that did that shook a country, you know, that, you know, people stood up and people were fighting for that. And, you know, like you have things like I don't know more and and these movements that can happen in Canada. And so, I mean, yeah, it, it would be really interesting to see you know, what sort of impact we could have if it was made available at a more, I guess, wider accessibility and, and a wider scale. But yeah, again, I think the progression that I've seen in the healthcare system is in the peers, is in the Indigenous people living with HIV that are, you know, there is some, some space being created where they can come in and, and use their medicine and their lived experience to have a positive impact on people that are, you know, indigenous people that are accessing healthcare. And, and so I, I raise my hands to community members like Danita, um, you know, for doing that really important work. And, you know, the downtown east side here in Vancouver, I've been, you know, fortunate enough to be able to contribute to those communities. And I'd just like to say that, you know, there is some action that's taking place that's that's benefiting uh you know people uh, in the healthcare system but you know it's it's kind of a small cry in in the larger scale things that dr albert mcleod was talking about but definitely there's there's effort there that i think needs to be recognized thank you very much for those uh those insights and uh things for people to really uh ponder about what we can do more, uh, what it has looked like in the past, what it is currently looking like. Um, and uh, as I pose my next question to the panelists, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back to the attendees, but I'm gonna pose this question for you to think about, and we're gonna give uh, each of you about uh, roughly about 30 seconds to, to answer this, as I'd love to get into um, one of our questions from the attendees, one to two questions from our attendees. So I'm gonna toss this to our, our panelists to think about is uh, what advice would you give to an activist uh, just starting this journey and what is needed going forward? Uh, so I'm going to give that to our panelists to think about, but I'm going to uh, remind our attendees that we are now going to open our last two polling questions, our live polling questions. So on the bottom of your screen there, uh, please go ahead and, and answer the following two attendees. Uh, in regards to how informed are you on Indigenous slash Two-Spirit issues? Uh, and number number four is like, what has the TRC, uh, has the TRC been worth, well, worthwhile, there you go, to whom does it benefit? So I think these are good questions to, to ask ourselves about that. But uh, we are going to uh, then just uh, move into the aspect of what advice would you give to activists just starting this journey and what is needed going forward. So maybe we'll go over to uh, uh, Elder Marjorie uh, Bukash and then we'll go over to Martin. Okay, I'm not sure about advice, but I would say work with uh, people who are ready, willing and able uh, and, and not the um, the ones that resist because that sucks up your energy and that working with negativity is is not really changing anything um i think another thing would be get a drum and beat it <laughs> it's like uh putting out good vibrations uh changes things because it reminds us of our humanity like that heartbeat it connects us right away and that drum draws people together and Anything like around ceremony draws people together and helps them feel human. Um, those are, are things I've learned along the way. Um, another thing I want is uh, talk dirty to me. <laughs> That's what I want a, a sex show on APTN and on every local radio station that we have our own sex talk show. We should have our own Dr. Ruth, you know. We should we should honor that sacred energy of creation that 
that energy of creator, whether we're making a loaf of bread, a baby, or art, it's all the same creator energy. And and we, we can make love. We can make good relations. We can send out those good vibrations. But I think if we had a, a forum, an ongoing forum, that every week, or, you know, people would, would have a chance to uh, share their their uh, questions and needs and, and stories that, that uh, it would become normal to talk about sex. It would become normal to talk about our relations and, and not just between men and women, but between two spirit and, and with people who are intergenerational. And, and before that, you know, grandmas used to talk dirty all the time. I mean, they, <laughs> they, 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 tease about, they used to tease about that and, and, uh, and all of those things. But now we don't, do, we don't see that anymore. Um, we have to have a place to do that. Have a uh, on an ongoing basis. That's, Perfect. That's my. Thank thing. you so much, Marjorie. Maybe right. you can be our next Sue Johansson on uh, APTN. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Whatever. Over to your to yourself, Martin, for about thirty seconds here. What advice would you give to an activist just starting this journey, and what is needed going forward? Um. I wouldn't even take my own advice, <laughs> so I'm, I'm not going to share advice. Um, what I will say and what I will share is some of my experience is that I think it's really important for me to establish and nurture relationships in the communities that I'm working with and be really careful that I'm not extracting um, knowledge and that I'm not, um, you know, making things uh like just really like the motives and 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 how i'm working in relation with other people and 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 how i'm supporting them and and what it is that i'm asking of them and and i think it's really important in activism to give people the freedom of their own expression and 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 really just give them opportunities to present themselves and, and you know that's i think that's really important too um i guess the other thing is you know, I've always been taught that that you can't pour from an empty cup. And so there's there's a certain amount of like spiritual nourishment that needs to happen on a personal level before it can happen on a community level. And uh, yeah, so I think I really appreciate about what our uh, elder Marjorie mentioned about the relationship building and, and how we are in relationship, um, you know, with everything around us in, in the Clinket language, we refer to it as the key and cow which is the flow of relationship in the spirits that are, you know, on with us. And so, yeah, I mean, I guess what's needed is, um, yeah, just the visibility and, and the voices of the community. And, you know, and, and I believe a real leadership style is, is more of a coordination and, and being behind the community members that you're working with not walking in front of them, but behind them, supporting them, empowering them, building relationships with them, following up with them, you know, offering them opportunities, giving them that freedom of, ex of expression and, and just really teaching and, and really living by example. I think for me, like it's, it's been, I mean, I've been taught that you never know who's listening. You never know who's witnessing what it is that you're doing. So the best thing you can do to contribute to your own community is to live your best life and, and to try your best within that community because it's it's setting an example and, and it's showing other people that, that it's possible to do these things. And, and that's been my experiences. There's so many leaders that have showed me and taught me that it is possible to do what they're doing and to become a part of those communities and active in those communities. Sorry for the, you know, two and a half minutes. That <laughs> That's good, you know. I'm always a, a, a believer in the fact that what's need to be said needs to be said. Uh, and like our indigenous concept of time uh, is much different from these colonial aspects. So even though there's like a clock up there, you know, it's, it's just a thing. That's all it is, just a thing. Um, but thank you for those kind words. I think it's very important that we do highlight the respectful reciprocal relationships and living our best life to be, uh, be, be, be leaders, I think, in, in our own regards by lifting people up uh, through living our, our, our 
best lives and our best journeys that we can and being that example for for everyone uh, that we may know or may not know you know who's who's looking even those little toddlers that are looking at us you know, they, they see that and we need to be those examples um, in saying so we are um, into some of our last minute items here for attendees i'd like you to i just want to give you a heads up that we're probably going to go over about five minutes here if you do need to run that's a okay uh, but we are going to push this uh session for about five minutes longer as we um, go to uh dr mcleod here for the last uh, two the last question and then we're going to try and go to at least one attendee q a um but uh Dr. McLeod, are you able to to hear me? This is the fun thing about like today's day yep. and age, eh? <laughs> awesome. Okay, uh, Auntie Albert, we're just asking uh, for about a 30 second, um, I suppose, view in regards to uh, what advice would you give to an activist uh, just starting this journey and what is needed going forward? Yeah, for me, you know, fall, uh, uh, Roger Roulette uh, shared a uh, uh, Ojibwe Minigouisi win. That means given or divine. So we have that ability to create using our intentions or mind. Again, three days calling all indigenous. So, in a way, everybody. Awesome. Hi, hi. All right. I'm going to tap my uh, co host here, Janessa, on the shoulder to uh, lead us into the evaluation portion as I look at our live QA to pull out which one of the lucky uh, attendees are going to that we'll uh, pull the questions from. And saying so, I do recognize that we do have a lot of Q&A uh, questions that have come through. Um, and maybe as a follow-up, we're going to take all of those questions and uh, find a way to uh, get some answers back to the attendees that have posed those. These, I'll revert everyone back to our Facebook event page. Please take a look at that, because I suspect that's where we'll be able to post those answers. Uh, but go ahead and, and take us away there, Janessa, when it comes to the evaluation. Oh, this class. Awesome. MG, if we can just get uh, Janessa pulled up on screen here. Oh, Janessa, you also might be on mute. That's a COVID proverb. <laughs> uh, no, not yet either. That is uh, a okay. While well, you figure out your uh, mic situation, uh, I may just uh, remind our attendees that we do have an evaluation portion that is uh, for all of the Aboriginal AIDS Awareness Week events. This evaluation portion, I believe, can be found in the uh, live polling aspect. Uh, this is for you to give some insights into, um, you know, what uh, what you've learned, which what what could be uh, tightened up. How can we stay connected? So feel free to go over to the live polling question as we ask those questions. And uh, Janessa, I'll I'll just give you a little heads up to you know if you are able to figure out uh, the mic situation, uh, we'll come back to you when we do our closing. But I would like to get to one of our attendee questions. Um, and because I, I am getting up there in age, I'm going to pull the questions to my larger screen so I can try and read them. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> okay. Wow, y'all attendees are, are, are very inquisitive. I love it. So as I said, we're going to try and take all of these questions and we'll put them up onto the Facebook page there, but I will ask. Oh, yes, this is a good one because all of our, our presenters here have worked both within uh, Canada and the United States. So I'm going to look to a question here. So the question is, 
what are some similarities and or differences you see between the United States and Canada Indigenous peoples to end HIV and to help those uh, living with HIV? So what are the differences between Canada and the United States uh, in regards to Indigenous peoples and uh, supporting those who are living with HIV? So we may start with um, I suppose whoever would like to go first. I know it's a big question as well. Yeah, I'll go first. I think part of the thing is um, we began this cross-border connection back in 1988 with the annual International True Spirit Gathering. And as I mentioned, you know, gay men were the sort of the first ones impacted by the pandemic. And so we've continued this gathering as sort of a uh, a bridging of our experiences, uh, whether we're in Canada or the US. And this year would have been the 33rd year, but it was postponed because of the pandemic of COVID. But again, it's that uh, sharing of tradition, knowledge, language, uh, landscapes with each other began in 1988. And I, and I consider it an indigenous response to HIV and AIDS, which really is a physical and a cultural social example of reconciliation and traditional healing where we traveled across uh, Turtle Island or North America to meet our relatives in the U.S. And I had an opportunity to go to Albuquerque uh, last March to their uh, national HIV AIDS conference and met a lot of uh, colleagues and counterparts there and that uh, you know there's a lot of similarities uh, in our histories, uh, colonization, historic trauma, uh, and what we're uh, dealing with, uh, as well as racism, in order to uh, uh, address HIV and AIDS. So uh, there's a lot of people uh, like uh, Raven, the heavy runner, uh, was involved very early on, still is. Uh, Beverly Little Thunder, uh, uh, oh, um, what's her name from this? Uh, Sharon Day from the US. Uh, you know, 20 years later, she's still running the Indigenous Peoples Task Force in Minneapolis. So I think there uh, has been a connection for over 30 years uh, between us and the United States in terms of addressing HIV and AIDS. Awesome. Thank you. I think we're all related. The border is, is not ours, you know, and, and we've never really... Uh, the, the state governments are pretty much the same everywhere. They're not interested in us or in our in our problems, and and that's what's similar. It's like we have to take it into our own hands mm -hmm. and do it our way. Thank you, Martin. I have a lot of experience uh, working in the U.S. I have seen some movement in New York City, and um, you know. To, to present at some of their, um, like the Indigenous Permanent Forum and whatnot. Um, I mean, I guess I, I, I haven't been fortunate enough to attend any sort of Indigenous um, HIV events in the States. However, I was invited to um, this big uh, pharmaceutical company hosted a um, community summit in San Diego in California. And, and it was really hard to see that, you know, there a lot of the epidemiology and a lot of the rates and scientific kind of numbers that they were using and, and the way that they were making reference to those people. And so in a lot of their research, there was there was no there was no indigenous people. And, and, and this is one of the big pharmaceutical companies in the States. And, and there's no research being done on, on indigenous people. And so you you get into these conference rooms and, and you sit and you look at these big screens and you see black and brown and 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 uh, they're referring to African American and Latino people. And I find it just, yeah, I mean that that was kind of what I experienced at, at this big pharmaceutical, you know, huge community summit. And and they did make some time they did make some time um, to have an Indigenous panel where you know, people from Japan were able to stand up and, and contribute to that visibility of Indigenous people. And, 
and so I'm grateful for them and, and that they had that opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. Yeah. Black, brown, and something else, eh? Mm -hmm. Pretty <laughs> much, yeah. <laughs> thank you so much for that. Uh, our attendees, I want to thank you for your kind patience. We uh, will be downloading all of those questions that have come through uh, via the live Q&A portion. Uh, but at this moment in time, uh, I'm going to uh, bring up my, 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 my co-host, Vanessa, here. And I just want to say a, a, a can ask Kopmatin to uh, Marjorie, uh, to Albert, and, and to Martin for all of your, your kind words. It is much appreciated uh, for you to come here and share your experiences and to lay out these, uh, these raw realities of the climate and the landscape for two-spirit people uh, who may be living with, affected by, uh, or who unfortunately have passed due to uh, HIV and AIDS complications at, at uh, at some point in time. Uh, so thank you. Uh, we will be in touch. And uh, without further ado, we're going to close out this this session here. I'm going to bring in my uh, co-host, Janessa. So Uji, if you wouldn't mind bringing Janessa on screen here when they're available. But in saying so, as we say, moistas to uh, Marjorie, to Albert, to Martin. Hey, hey. Oh, me, kisses. I got Catching those, catching those, putting them in my pockets for later. You know, got to keep those. <laughs> um, yes, I do want to, uh, I don't know if we're able to get Janessa up here on screen as of yet. Uh, Janessa is on main stage. Okay, I think. I do not see her on my end. So a quick confirmation. Yes, no, maybe so. It could also be my own connection. She's in the green oh. room. I think she's in the green room, the blue room. Stage, but I just can't hear her. I can see y'all. Can you hear me? I can hear yeah. you. Oh, oh okay. Oh, there well, we go. You don't have to look at me. That's okay. Oh. <laughs> oh. Uh, if we can't, I don't know. Are we able to get me up there? If not, I'm happy to just chat. Um, I would like to, again, just echo what Jack said. Thank you so much for sharing your stories, your experiences. Um, for those of you who don't know, I'm a Master of Public Health student, and I'm really hoping to get into policy um, and program planning. And so I'm, I'm here to listen, and I'm taking everything that you're saying, and I'm, I'm storing that, and I really want to bring... Um, I'd like to make a change in the world. And so hearing what you have to say really inspires me. And I hope that I can help in whatever way possible um, to make access to healthcare um, and HIV more accessible for Indigenous people and make the processes in the healthcare system here in Canada more comfortable for people who are Indigenous here. Um, that's my goal. And if I can help one person, um, then that's, you know, I've done my job in this world. So thank you so much for sharing. And I'll take everything that you've said and, and carry it with me forever. So just a reminder that there are some polling questions for the evaluation. And if you're able to complete those, it would be much appreciated. On behalf of the Canadian Aboriginal AIDS Network and in partnership with Out Saskatoon and Jack Saddleback, I would like to thank you so much for attending this session. Uh, thanks for being here. Thank you for listening. And this afternoon, we have some films that will be screened. So we have from our own Martin Moorberg, HIV Healing Inner Voices, which is a new project that he's worked on just recently. We have Second Stories, which is a National Film Board of Canada film and we also have one um, that Jack put forward yesterday and Jack do you want to talk a little bit about there's heart here for sure so the uh, there's heart here a little short documentary it's about 16 minutes long uh, it's a roller derby champion activist uh, cyclist uh, actually follows three indigenous members of the two-spirit and LGBTQ community as a journey towards self-acceptance, supportive health care, and communities that celebrate them as much as it does have this roller derby champion, which is like super sweet if y'all are into a roller derby. Uh, it also has this uh, this uh, cyc this two-spirit cyclist who happens to be a uh, transgender. And the last story that is shown in there is an individual uh, who is living with uh, HIV 
and the resiliency and sense of community that they have found within the Two-Spirit community and, and the larger HIV community when it comes to uh, their own uh, being and identity. So it's a great little film and I highly encourage everyone to uh, come and check it out. Come hang out with us, come watch some shows. Yeah, so that'll be happening at two o'clock Central Standard Time, so three o'clock Eastern and noon Pacific time. And if you haven't registered for that session already, I'm just going to drop the link in the discussion form here and you can register for the afternoon session. So again, thank you so much for joining us. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and we really hope to see you this afternoon at the film screenings. Thank you. Awesome. Can I put, in a, can I put in a plug for my film? Yes. <laughs> Uh, Memengua Masinate was a community-based art project that I that I mentioned early on. Uh, it's on my Vimeo site if you want to uh, check it out. It's Butterflies, Patterns of Light, but it, it showcases uh, an approach with uh, community arts for HIV AIDS. And uh, it's still relevant, even though it was made like 10, 20, I don't know. Uh, 15 years ago, but uh, it's still there. And the, the coming in stories with uh, Saskatchewan, uh, it's also there on my Vimeo site if anybody wants to watch. Mm. Just Vimeo, Marjorie Bocage, and you'll get there. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, Vimeo, Marjorie Bocage. Go check it out. Uh, but we look forward to seeing some of our attendees uh, this afternoon for our art showcase. And uh, we look forward to, to more discussions as we go along. You know, as much as this is Aboriginal AIDS Awareness Week, this is simply not a placeholder in time. This is uh, this work right here, as was stated by all three of our panelists, this work is all year round. It does not stop with this week. There are 51 other weeks that we, as a community, work hard to ensure that we are dismantling stigma and that we're dismantling the systemic barriers and that we are uplifting our resilient community members who are living with affected by uh, HIV and AIDS. Uh, so, uh, Kinasko Moten, I uh, thank you so much. And uh, I say, moistas uh, or see you later, as there is no goodbye in Cree. So, thank you so much for attending. Bye, hey, hey. bye. Bye, everybody. Bye, love you.